we are going to begin our last unit in chemistry 20 called chemical analysis and stoichiometry. And we're going to start out by doing an introduction in stoichiometry to get a little taste of what this unit will look like. So what is stoichiometry? Stoichiometry essentially is a measurement of uh, different reactants and products in a chemical reaction and we're looking at the amount or the ratio between our products and reactants in that given reaction. So essentially we're looking at the whole number ratio of our balanced chemical reaction and looking at how our reactants and products are uh, affected or, or determined by those ratios. So, chemical reaction equations. What do the reactions tell us? Well, if we were to think of a reaction with copper metal and silver nitrate, we can kind of know at least the balanced chemical reaction. So let me just jot this down here. We have copper metal and silver nitrate. Oops. AgNO3. And we would expect this to be a double replacement reaction. So we would expect this to form silver metal, I'm running out of room here, and copper nitrate. Okay, so this is what we would expect Oops, our reaction to look like. Now we would also probably need two of those and two of those, so we have a balanced chemical reaction and that's what we know so far from our science careers. But how do we know how much copper to use or how much silver nitrate to use? What does this chemical reaction look like? Like what does it appear to, to be? And does our silver nitrate need to be an aqueous solution or can I just throw some silver nitrate on it? So this chemical reaction actually tells us very little about what's going on. Now we can make some assumptions based on what we already know about chemistry, however, until we actually have some empirical evidence, it becomes challenging to figure out. So if we look at this example down below, this is copper and silver nitrate. Notice copper is this copper metal here, and it's a clear colorless solution. As I have the reaction progress, I have some blue color being formed, I have silver being formed on my copper wire, and as the reaction finishes to completion, I have my uh, copper wire, very blue solution, and very uh, uh, quite a bit more silver formed on that copper wire. So until we complete an experiment, we won't know actually much about that chemical reaction. Now some limitations of chemical reactions. What do chemical reactions not really tell us? There's definitely minimal information on temperature and pressure in a chemical reaction. Okay, there's also no information about the process or progress of the chemical reaction. This includes how much time this chemical reaction might take to occur. Okay, and there's nothing about measurable quantities, how much mass of each entity is required for this chemical reaction. All of that information is left out. So basically, we're looking at a way to figure all of this out. So, some reaction assumptions that we need to think about while we are talking about stoichiometry. We say that all reactions are spontaneous. Essentially, reactions will occur regardless of what the reactants are. Okay, reactions are fast, so we expect them to occur quickly within some sort of reasonable time. We expect them to be quantitative. In other words, if we have uh, one mole of a certain entity in a reactant, we expect to see that as the same amount in a product. So the reaction goes to completion. We don't stop the reaction midway. Okay, and we also say that they are stoichiometric, meaning that there's simple whole number ratios of our products and our reactants, and this also means 100% conservation of mass. So, let's take a look at this concept of net ionic equations. Now, Net ionic equations are essentially a way to tell us what is really going on in a chemical reaction. A little bit, uh, at least a little bit more than what our sort of standard chemical reaction is. So again, if we look at our example of copper and silver nitrate, dissolving in a reactant is often an easy way to get entities separated from each other so that they can collide with entities of another reaction. We know that if we have an ionic compound and we dissolve it in water, 
it becomes two ions, the cation and the anion, because of the dissociation. So those dissociated ions can then collide with different entities of another reactant, in this case, copper metal. So the chemical analysis techniques are required to determine how much solute is in an aqueous solution. So we require some sort of analysis to figure out how much solute is dissolved in an aqueous solution. Now we know that ionic compounds uh, like acids and bases and, ion, uh, and including ionic compounds dissociate. So when we write ionic equations, we know that we can dissociate our aqueous ionic com uh, compounds and say that they are aqueous. So what I would do is if I'm looking at my example, example of my silver and copper nitrate, in my net equation it looks something like this. Copper solid plus silver nitrate, which is what we've seen so far, gives us silver solid and copper nitrate. And when we balance this, we have two of these and two of these, and these are aqueous, and these are aqueous. So I'm just going to zoom in here so we can see this really good. So essentially, what it's saying is that I know that because this is an aqueous solution, I can dissociate those ions. So I get copper solid, I get two silver ions, two Ag positives, and I get two nitrate ions. Now the reason why I have two is because this coefficient uh, can be expanded to both of our ions. Okay, now this forms two copper or two solid silvers, pardon me, and and it produces one copper ion and that copper ion is a two positive charge and two nitrate ions. So this is what we would say is our total ionic equation. This is every ion that we have present in our chemical reaction. Now, one thing you might know from previous lessons is that if we have an entity that is equal on our reactant side to our product side, and that means everything down to its state of matter, these are both aqueous on this side, we see that we can cancel out common entities. So I have copper solid, and on this side I have copper two positive. These are not completely identical. I have a copper atom on my reactant side and a copper ion on my product side, so I can't cancel those out. Same with silver, I have silver ions on my reactant side and silver atoms on my product side. Although I have my mass balanced, I cannot cancel those out. I have two nitrate ions, and two nitrate ions. Thus, I can cancel out only my two nitrate ions. Then, when I go to write out my net ionic equation, this is called my net, and this is exactly what we're looking at. So our net ionic equation is copper solid plus two silver ions. We do not need to include our nitrate. And we produce two silver atoms and copper two ions. This is my net equation, my net ionic equation. I have that my only entities that really play a role in terms of our chemical reaction are the copper and silver ions and atoms. Now nitrate needed to be there in order for this compound to dissociate, however, it is what we call a spectator ion. It has no role or change in its mass in our chemical reaction. So therefore, it's what we call spectator ions. Let's take another look at an example here. Okay, now we have lead nitrate and sodium iodide. So we have lead nitrate, which is Pb, and it's lead 2, so lead nitrate, PbNO3, 2. Okay, and it looks like these are both solutions, so we're, they're aqueous and sodium iodide, NaI solution, also aqueous. Okay, we expect this reaction to occur. Lead iodide and sodium nitrate. Now, notice I do not know my state of matter on either of these entities. It is incredibly important to take a look at my chemistry data book, at my solubility table, 
which I'll have to scroll down to find here. So when I take a look at my solubility table, this will tell me whether this is aqueous or a solid. So when I take a look, I see here that if I look at lead iodide, I find my iodide. And when I go down my table, unless I f find it in this entity, it's soluble. Here we go. I find lead two ions to be insoluble with iodide. So my lead iodide will actually be insoluble. It will be a solid or what we call a precipitate. If I look at nitrate, unless it falls in this one of these four compounds, it's soluble. So sodium nitrate is soluble. So when we jump back to our entities, we have lead iodide as being a solid and sodium nitrate as being aqueous. So this kind of throws us for a little bit of a loop because what we know is that when we have an aqueous solution, we can dissociate our entities. But in this case, I have two aqueous solutions. I have lead to, I have two nitrates, two NO3s. Oh, and let me just make sure that this is balanced. It is not. There we go, now it is. So this is aqueous. This is aqueous also. We have also two sodium ions that are aqueous. And we have two iodides that are aqueous. So there's our reactants. So this then forms lead iodide, but because lead iodide is a solid, we cannot dissociate it. It remains to be lead iodide. It does not dissociate. It is a solid entity. It's not aqueous. So it stays at, as a solid. And then we have two sodium ions because this is aqueous. We can dissociate them. And two nitrate ions. These are also aqueous. So again, I can cancel out my common entities. And when I take a look here, I see that my nitrate ions are the same on both sides. I also notice that my sodium ions are the same on both sides. I can cancel them out. However, I cannot cancel out my lead and my iodide because there's lead and iodide ions on my reactant side and lead iodide solid on my product side. So when I go to write out my net equation, and I'm just going to jot this up here because I'm running out of space, I get that I have lead ions and iodide ions, and there's two of them, don't forget that. And this forms lead iodide. This is my net ionic equation. My two ions forming my product, and the remaining are what we call spectator ions. So pretty cool. Okay, so to write a net ionic equation, we complete a balanced chemical reaction. We have a full balanced chemical reaction using whole number coefficients. We dissociate all high solubility ionic compounds, acids, and bases. Okay, so we have ionic compounds that dissociate, acids that dissociate, and bases. Okay, and that is only our strong acids and our strong bases. Okay, we cancel out identical entities that appear on both the reactant and product sides, and we write the net ionic equation reducing coefficients if necessary. Now, essentially, we only, we, if we have solids, liquids, or gases, and let's write that down, if we have solids, liquids, or gases that are produced in our chemical reaction, they have to remain as a solid, liquid, or gas. They will not ionize. So if I get, um, like in my previous example with my lead iodide, it was a solid, I leave it as a solid in my chemical reaction. It does not dissociate or ionize. Okay, so that is very important. If you see anything that is sort of in its full elemental state or if it's in a solid, liquid, or gas, it's not aqueous, okay, we leave those entities as they are and we do not change them or dissociate any of those. Okay? So another thing to note is that we can have these things called limiting reagents and excess reagents. Now a limiting reagent is essentially a reactant whose entities are completely consumed in a reaction 
and an excess reagent is the reactant whose entities are present in surplus amounts, so that some is remaining at the end of the reaction. Now this often occurs in our chemical reactions because we have an entity that will be used up first. So uh, a good way to think about this is if we have our example with our lead iodide, uh, sorry, our lead nitrate and our sodium iodide reacting together, if I have a beaker of sodium nitrate and I, or sodium iodide, sorry, and I have just a dropper full of lead nitrate, okay, that reaction is not going to move forward very rapidly, or if it does, it's not going to be a complete reaction because we have way less of our lead iodide, or sorry, I should write this out so I keep on saying the right thing. We have lead nitrate and sodium iodide. So like I said, if you have this and you have a beaker full of sodium iodide and only one drop of lead nitrate, okay, you have a lot more or you have excess of sodium iodide and limiting of lead nitrate. So this would not be a full complete reaction Okay, we would have a limiting reagent and an excess reagent. Unless we measured out the exact quantities of each to have a complete reaction, okay, this there will always be a limiting and excess reagent unless we calculate perfect ratios of our chemical amounts. All right, so this was just the basic introduction into our stoichiometry unit. There's three more stoichiometry lessons to follow, one on gravimetric stoichiometry, one on gas stoichiometry, and one on solution stoichiometry, which are super interesting. So if you need to go back, take any notes, or, or go through some examples, please do that now, and good luck.